Hi, this is Taxi's Chronicles and I'm your host, Simon Rushton. Today we have a lovely lady, a very young looking lady, but she's not that young. Um, her name's Shante. She runs children's homes and considering I come from children's homes, it's something that's dear to my heart and she's agreed to do an interview. So Shante, how did you get into the industry of running children's homes? So my mum is a social worker okay. and she used to work in children's homes and she only stopped about two years ago. Okay. So um, that's how I first got introduced to children's homes. I used to be a teacher and I just started to enjoy working more with the challenging kids mm -hmm. and I thought I wanted to do more background in like where ch more challenging kids came from. So when I started looking into care that's when I came into a children's home. And did you have to do any special qualifications and things like that? So do a level three, an MVQ level three in childcare, um, residential childcare specifically. And then I'm currently doing a level five in management course. So it's really broken down then? Yeah. Okay, that's good, that's good. And how long have you been in the industry for? Two and a half years. And how are you finding it? It's challenging, it has its good days, it has its bad days. Um, obviously, me being young is, is more relatable to the kids in a sense, um, in how they, in knowing what it, the world goes on at the minute, but it still comes with a lot of challenges. Do they look at you, so I suppose there'll be advantages and disadvantages from my point of view, yeah. being young, because they may not take you that seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and they see you as one of them, yeah. or even they try and hit on you, being the opposite <laughs> sex, and that kind of thing. How, how have you found it? Do you know what? Um, I've t kind of not taken on a mother role in there because there's a lot of older people in there who can take on that mother role. If you take on a kind of big sister role, rather than you just got to know, like where I've taken the big sister role, they, they have the level of respect for me. They might They might push it a little bit, but it, other than that, they have those levels of respect. What brings to mind is how did you cope during the lockdown? Oh wow, that was a struggle. Because you're telling them they can't go out. Yeah. And these kids are not used to being told what to do. No, it's not at all. In that respect, so I know from children's home. And yeah. when I was in children's home, there's about 18 to 20 of us. Yeah, oh but wow. This was, this was in the 70s. Yeah, no, this is it's changed now. There's yeah. only six of them. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. imagine dealing imagine. with like 18, 20 or Yeah. Kids. That's a classroom. That would be, yeah, that would be And crazy. there's bunk beds. Oh, One wow. room with loads of bunk beds. It's a bit yeah. like an orphanage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's very different. So it, it was hard, but trying to keep them like occupied within the home and even when you're doing their little like essential shops, just taking one of them out or taking them for walks, longer walks. They, do you know what helped? I think is that I know like some of them are from like quite their backgrounds. They're involved with the police, so some of them are on tag. So that they, it means they had to be in the house anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing's changed for you anyway. No, exactly. Nothing's changed for you. There's still nothing's going to change just yet. So you're in the house anyway. But um, I think because they understood the seriousness of what was going on in the world, like having conversations with them and talking about what is going on in the world, mm -hmm. they, they kind of understood like they don't want to get sick. And we was making it more of a, right. like one of them got sick. So we had to self-isolate him in his room. But where I think the rest of them saw that, oh, he's not allowed out, he can't go. So to, when he got sick, was it corona? Was it just we, like the he flu? Had, well, he had symptoms of the flu. They, they didn't know whether it was corona because obviously he couldn't go to the doctors. But because he was so young, he recovered within about two, well, a week and a half, he was fully recovered. But um, he was obviously given all of his food in his room, like the staff had to wear all the correct PPE. So he was everything. climbing the walls? Yeah, basically. It's not but fair. Yeah, it's not Sorry. fair. <laughs> yeah, whereas everyone was like, everyone else that was, wasn't was in their rooms, they sort of saw what was happening. They were like, well, uh, no. I don't want to get sick. I'm yeah, allowed that's that. Not me. Um, yeah, it's, I'm not, <laughs> it's not the one. Yeah. It's not the one. That's what I'm saying. It's not the one. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so what kind of things do you... Uh, so did you, sorry, did you find that they became much more interested in the news and current affairs? Yeah, definitely. So there's watching things. So they were watching um, more of the news. They were seeing like the death toll. They were, um, 
I found they became more connected with their families as well. Like they would try and call in to maybe their parents and see how they're doing. Okay. Even the ones that have like quite strange relationships with their parents, they were still checking in to see if their parents were okay or if their family members were okay. Did you find that they wanted to go back to their families? No, none of them wanted to go back. It was oh. just more checking on them. Okay. Yeah. I but I found like now it's easy. Some of them want to go and see their family members more and meet with them. So oh. it, it might be, a, it probably was a good thing in reflection to how they are mm. and what they do. I'm ex-military. So what, 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 what I always love about the military is that they can take people from all walks of life yeah. and get them to bond in a very short point of time where they're willing to die for each other. Yeah. And what it taught me is that trauma, as in, or hard experiences, because the training program, depending yeah. on what section of military you go through, is quite traumatic. Yeah. So that brings people together. It does, yeah. So when you're, what age group are your children? The youngest is 14 and the oldest is seven, 16. Oh, so, so we usually get from... really that pain in the arse thing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry we get them from that. about 11 and we can have them till they're 18. Okay. But we try not to keep them until they're 18 and give them like semi-independence once they turn 16. Okay. Um, and give, put them in a semi-independence home when mm. they turn 16. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but like I said, it just brings people to brings people we together could, yeah and it's that same experience people start to reflect on their parents yeah and all that kind of thing so i think that's probably been the one positive thing out um, that you can always put your finger on yeah family wise out of covid yeah obviously negative things are that um people get divorced yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i've had quite a few customers who's just packing their stuff into my car <laughs> what are you doing just, do you want an interview no yeah. <laughs> I've just left him. <laughs> yeah. But I've had positive stories. Yeah. It brought people together. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how do you see? Do you do have to do any social distancing within, like, as a as a must now within the children's home? No. Um. No, not really, because they're all from in the same home, and they don't really venture out. It's very rare that they venture out. But what they do, what we do do, is that if they do go out. The minute they come in, they go straight upstairs, they change their clothes, they, they go in the shower. Um, the only thing, what the staff was doing, it was that it was a, it was kind of like a block rotor. Mm -hmm. So you would work four days in a row and then the same, four, the same two staff would be working for those four days mm -hmm. and then the next two staff would come in. So it would never be across like a changeover mm -hmm. of staff. It was never in and out, in and out. It was always a set block amount. Okay. which was helpful so the social distancing in the home wasn't so bad yeah i understand so you're minimizing the cross contamination yeah and the familiarity yeah. yeah that's good that's really good Definitely. are they allowed guests in the house we weren't having guests for co during covid um now if it's an essential visit they're allowed the guests but they we have to do temperature checks is that an essential visit? Is that like it's got to be their kin? Um, yeah, it might could be social worker, yeah, yeah or, that's what I mean. yeah, or so, like the police, yeah. yeah. So authorities and kin, kin, yeah. Family. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. family, they can come and see them outside, just outside the home on the portrait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I suppose they do video calls. And they do, calls yeah. Now, they've so. got all technology, phones, everything. So. So you don't really need it that much. No. Oh, that makes sense. So do you foresee yourself carrying on in this career? I do, because I really, it's one, it's one thing I enjoy and it's watching the changes in like their lifestyles and everything I enjoy doing. Um, but not in like a rotor based business, maybe in a management, more in a having my own care home yeah, at some stage. Because I think the, the shifts can be, it's, emo it's an emotionally draining job. It's not, it's not physically draining, like, at all. I don't find it physically draining, but, like, the stories, that the backgrounds of the kids and what sometimes, like, why they're in the care home, what happened in their past, you get some traumas, some traumatics, and you get some self-harm, as you get, you get all types of things, so it's emotionally draining to be there, mm -hmm. to say, like, I do, like, sometimes 200 hours a month. So really? to do, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
for so 50 to do, hours a week. Yeah, so to do but that. You're staying the night there, aren't you? Staying the night, yeah. So, yeah, it's understandable. Though. Yeah. So it's a 12 hour shift. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you could do four shifts. Four, and you, yeah. And then you hit your 12 hours. 12 hours, yeah. Hours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. But yeah. you get a lot of self satisfaction. Yeah. yeah. You do. What kind of issues are these children having? Because I'll give you an example. When I was in children's home, um, my I've had people who have been their parents had sexually abused them, yeah. stuck at them, or parents have tried to kill them. Yeah. And those kind of things. It's quite, you know, full on. Yes. Yeah, so what, what? There's um, there's a range in the house. So you've got like parent neglect. You've got neglect on some of them. When you say neglect, how so? So, um, a parent has mental health. Yeah. So, it was locking the child in the room for weeks. No food. Like, just dropping the kid water in, but barricading the door so the kid couldn't get out. Um, then the child carried a knife into school, wanted to kill themselves in school. Cause, and the, but the parent doesn't even know whether the child's a boy or a girl. It's, it, that kind of neglect, that kind of, because it's just their mental how health. How do you deal with a parent like that? To be honest, we try to... That child's on a full care order, so we wouldn't really have to deal with that parent as much. Mm. But we try to monitor and speak, especially to that parent's social worker, to see how their mental health is doing. So then when it's quite positive, if they're taking the right medication and everything, then obviously we can, we can um, speak to that parent and just let their parent know how that child's getting on. Um, we've got some of that. We've got... A, some that struggle with their child's sexuality or they don't understand their child's sexuality. What do you mean? So we've got a child who can be quite feminine, but their parents, uh, like Jamaican background, yeah, yeah. were like, so yeah, they no. Don't tolerate yeah, they yeah. don't tolerate it. So it was yeah. like, no, I'm going to dump you on this child, dump you here, dump you there. And then, um, yeah, that's another struggle. Um, what else do we have? Um, it's some of them are the latest three we've had are like they're involved in serious crimes yeah. outside so like knife knife crimes uh, robbery oh, 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 because drugs so that's not that's not anything to do with I suppose you could say it's not anything to do with the parent but that's well one of them is like the parent took the child to do the robbery <laughs> so <Okay>. yeah <laughs> so um so it's like they wouldn't say it's necessarily the parent but if it, like a child's been going missing for a number of occasions the child keeps going missing the child keeps going missing they might say oh well the parent has no control over that child mm -hmm. and then bring them into care where you, they think mm. the carers will have more control over it do you find the numbers of child these child issues are rising or staying the same or lowering? I think they're rising. Um. I believe they're rising, yeah. Like, more, not so much the, the parental neglect one. I think that is, that's not rising, but more, more so I, I feel like the government, when it comes to knife violence, whatever, drugs and all of that, they definitely just put the child... Um, they just put the child in care thinking that's the solution and that sometimes that's not even the solution they could just be at home and you could just speak to the parent it could be the parent needs some support with yeah. their parenting okay. but i feel like putting them into care is just giving them more of an opportunity to go out there and do as they please because like we're not you have uh, to build a relationship with that child yeah, to get them to behave exactly yeah so it's like i could tell a child no you can't go out but that's not my that's not my child. So they'll be like, well, I'm going out and you can't tell me anything. And I can't lock them in the house because it's not a prison. So it's mm -hmm. like, if they're going to go out, they're going to go out. And it, but if it, coming from a mother, coming, coming from their own mother, be like, no, you can't go out. You can't, like, you shouldn't yeah. be doing that. They're, they're more so to listen because that's the, the relationship. Do you have monetizing schemes where, let's say like YouTube, as a podcaster, YouTube and things like that are ways to make money, Instagram, things like that. So you introduce them to, like, you want to start learning about YouTube. You can start talking yeah. about what have you. You can start, you start getting paid. Yeah. And then they kind of got a purpose. Yeah, that's I find what... if they have a purpose and they're not 
yeah that's the best that's the like what we most try to do like we they got an in-house studio Oh, so studio in filming or music music because music, they all love they all love their music so you know they all but we try to make the, the kind of rapping that they do and when we try not to make it so negative yeah but in the same sense they do have to talk about their real life about situation. their real life situation you can't tell them to talk about family. no no exactly yeah. <laughs> so yeah mm-hmm. okay well this interview could go on. We've run out of time. That was a really interesting um, uh, experience of hearing yeah. that story. Yeah. It was sad as well, it, yeah. but enlightening. Things have not changed. We still have bad parents. Yeah. We could have gone into the parent side of things. Think, well, my views are very strong coming from children's home. I yeah. believe in sterilization for certain parents and probably execution for certain parents yeah. also. <laughs> But we won't go down that alley. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm talking as a product of, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. But on another note to the audience, um, I hope you liked this episode. Obviously, it was really dear to my heart. Feel free to leave a comment in the info box below, an info link below. Do not forget, we have our sister podcast called Africa Investor Stories, all about real investors with real stories talk about how they invested in Africa, why they invested in Africa. To give you a tip, Africa has the fastest growing economies on the planet and the fastest growing population on the planet. With more people, more business opportunities, etc, etc, but I won't go into it anymore. I'll let those people talk when you are listening. Apart from that, have a nice day and stay, stay safe. <laughs>